Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Tracksuit Rundown. Your hosts, Alex Makatsari and the knowledgeable Maxwell Green. Guys, we're in Miami. Indian Wells is wrapped up. Uh, of course, Max is going to join us. I mean, this is the American... What what, what's the name for American Double? What's it, the... It's the Sunshine, Sunshine Swing. Sunshine Double, I think it's yeah. called. To have uh, Indian Wells and then Miami back-to-back. Um, two Masters 1000s tournament, which is the only time of the year that happens, right? Where you have two back-to-back in the US. Last time, we kind of took you guys through Indian Wells chronologically. So we had things happen in the first round, then things you know, went on in the quarterfinals. There were kind of highlights throughout the tournament. We're gonna con- you know, continue, follow a similar pattern. Not the craziest tournament so far. Not a, f- a few things, you know, a few notable mentions, a few things happened, uh, but let's start beginning of the tournament. What's, uh, what are some notable things to talk about? Yeah, so I think where we need to start on the men's side is, you know, you, you mentioned it, not, not the craziest tournament, but we did see a, a fair share of um, some upsets in the second round. You know, we, we saw an absolute um, destruction of Holger Rune, 6-1, 6-1, losing to Fabian Maratson, who has just turned into such a phenomenal player at uh, Masters 1000s. I, I think his record is 13 and three in Masters main draws um, and has never failed to reach at least the round of 16. We saw Tiafo losing, Sissipas losing second round, which, you know, they're not having the greatest seasons kind of to be expected. They're very susceptible to upsets. Um, we saw Taylor Fritz yeah. lose a match that you know, Fritz is usually a guy that you count on to at least win a couple rounds. And he lost to the Brazilian Saboth Wild. Um, what else? Who else did we have? We had a couple. I mean, um, I know... Oh, Rublev losing. Rublev lost. I mean, that's not... I, honestly, that is a kind of a surprising one considering, you know, you look at how Rublev plays in the Grand Slams and he's made, you know, he's made nine quarterfinals at, at Grand Slams. Masters 1000s, you know... They're the second best thing. So you'd expect someone like Rublev to do well at, at a big tournament like Miami. Um, that was another surprising surprising upset. The, I wanted to touch on um, Moritzen a little bit. So you said 13-3 and three in Masters 1000s. Um, you also said that he has reached a round of 16. Every Is, single time. Every single time he's played a Masters Yeah, 1, I mean, 000? granted, he hasn't played, obviously, he's All only home. played 16 right. matches so far. Right. Um. But yeah, he's very consistent. I mean, obviously he had that big win over Alcaraz last year. Yeah. And he, he just gets the job done. I think he had a good run in Shanghai as well. I know he beat uh Dibby Noor last year. So he he's a he's a great player. I mean, I was I was saying if he he has all the weapons to become a, a top ten player, in my opinion. Now it's just trying to find that consistency to be able to beat those guys that are in the top 50, top 40, top 30. Yeah. Because when he's on his game, he is so dangerous. Like yeah. he, he can beat any of the any of the top guys. Yeah, very solid on the baseline. You were, I mean, we were watching his match uh, and we were saying that probably the only area where he has room for improvement is his serve, yeah. right? Uh, it's not the most... It's not a Ben Shelton surf. <laughs> yeah, and, and he's an athletic guy, and he does have height on him. So I feel like that's something that, you know, could easily be worked on and improved. He's, he's not like a Schwartzman, for example, yeah. who's, you know, wasn't blessed with being over six foot. Yeah. So that, that's something that I could see him improving over time. But it's interesting because he was a very, he's a very good clay court player as well, yeah. all, really all surfaces. So... Looking forward to seeing how he does in this tournament and, and beyond the rest of the year. Another guy that goes unnoticed on the ATP tour. You know, we, we talked Arnaldi, Jari, these guys that, that are doing really well and are beating some of the top guys that, that get a lot of attention. Um, Moritzen is another guy that is just someone who doesn't get the recognition that he deserves. Based on what you're saying, I mean, you're saying he has that, you know, he has uh, top 10 potential. He very well might have top 10 potential. Maybe we'll see him in, in the top 10 or top 15 or whatever. Again, someone that I just feel like he's going to pop up and people are going to be like, where the hell did this guy yeah. come from? Um, so definitely keep an eye on this guy. He's very, very good. 
Uh, one thing that we should talk about, though, is that how many of the upsets were American? Not a good week for American tennis, I must say. In, um, in the U.S. as well. In the U.S., you know, obviously we mentioned we had Fritz and Tiafo, And then, unfortunately, we did have, you know, Traxy Rundown favorite Tommy Paul go out due to an injury, yeah. though, which... Um, you know, he's been struggling with that ankle. He he hurt it in Indian Wells, thought he was recovered, and then this week he rolls it again in, in Miami against a young American, Martin Dam. Yeah, I mean, it comes at a good time. Hopefully he takes a few weeks off to recover, right. so he's he's ready for clay court season. But uh, unlucky for him, after a great run in Indian Wells a week ago. Yeah, no, it, it's tough for America. I feel like Americans... They all either do really well together or they all lose together. There's no, I mean, obviously that's not true. There are tons of times where you have one or two Americans uh, do really well at a tournament and then the rest of them lose. But it just feels like there's such a big, um, I guess you would call it group of American tennis players, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's what, 10 in the top 100? Something yeah, like that, you know, whatever the number is, I, I'm not a lot of young. Guys I'm not too. sure off the top of my head, but there's a lot of up and coming prospects. There's a lot of guys who are really good now and are in the you know top thirty, top twenty. Well, there's um, four in that ten to twenty range. You have Fritz, Paul, Tiafo, and Shelton, Shelton that are yeah. all knocking on the door. Tiafo's starting to drop off a bit, yeah. um, but other than that, I mean, you have what Nakashima, Giron. I mean, a, a couple. A few, yeah, a they're lot of scattered guys. throughout the top 100. So, it, but it's so it's interesting that sometimes when they all lose, you see those American flags in the draw, <laughs> and it seems like they they all lose together. So, unfortunate for for the Americans uh, this tournament, especially considering this is I'd say probably top three biggest tournaments in the U.S. I mean, I know there's Cincinnati and and some others, but I mean Cincinnati U.S. Open, Indian Wells. Yeah, yeah it's definitely top it's top, top top three, three. four. Yeah, so tough tough to see. Uh, those guys lose. But yeah, and then also speaking on injuries, you t you mentioned Tommy Paul rolling his ankle. The big I mean that was obviously a, a big deal. Not I feel like not as dramatic though as what happened with uh, a f fan favorite Mr. Andy Murray. Yeah. Which by the way, I want to mention Andy Murray quick side note and apologies for the side note, but that we made a video a tracksuit rundown a, f a few weeks ago, or not a few weeks ago, but maybe like a couple months ago where we were talking about some of the greats and we didn't mention Andy Murray for whatever Big reason. Big, we, we have nothing against Andy Murray. Someone commented was like, you guys have something against Andy Murray. We do not. We love Murray. We love Murray. We just are idiots. Um, but yeah, Andy Murray, fan favorite. And he is in the third set. Loves a battle, this guy. I mean, this guy, he, he's having his classic tournament. You know, he goes three sets in the first round against Berrettini. Right. Another three sets... Against Echevarri. Was it three sets against Echevarri? I think it was like seven, six. I think it was, it was two close sets, match. but it was close seven, match. six, six, whatever. I think it was two sets against Echevarri, but it, um, he loves a three set battle. This guy, oh, God. this guy, if he has the ability to stay on court for an extra hour, he will take it. He loves the court time. Yeah, he loves the court time. So, three set battle against, um, Mahach. Mahach. Thomas Mahach. Uh, we, we just learned how to pronounce this guy's uh, name. I don't even know if I got it right that, that time. But uh, up and comer, Mahach, who is what, 60 in the world? Yeah, around there. 60 in the world, battling it out. Third set. He's down, I think, something he, like 5 2. He was, Murray was down 5 2 in the third set. Right. Claws his way back to 5 5. And at 5 5, he hits a ball and basically pops up on one leg and obviously in a lot of pain he can't put any pressure on 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 one of his legs and hobbles his way to the bench well he, yeah he ru he's running for a ball i think he's running for a ball you see him sprint he gets it and that's when he yeah. kind of starts hobbling on on a leg now when we were watching the match we were thinking okay maybe he's cramping or, or cramping. something like that because he Got back up, yeah. continued to play match, took the match to a tie break, lost in a very close tie break. I mean, had m different opportunities was to win the match. Was up 5-4 in the tie break serving yeah. for the match. Exactly. So was really had a lot of chances. And then, lo and behold, he turns out to have torn, 
I mean, what did two he tear? different? So it was a full rupture of his ATFL, which is a ligament in your ankle, and um, a near full rupture of another ligament called CFL. Yeah. So not great. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> he's going to be sidelined for. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he sidelined for the whole clay court season. Yeah, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the recovery time on that is, but if you're, you have almost two full ruptures, that's, that's not good. Yeah. And then on top of that, well, what did he tweet? He tweeted something out. He was like, "I'm gonna be back with one hip and <laughs> one." You no, know, it was like two metal hips and yeah. one metal ankle yeah. or something like that. It was something along those lines. But um, obviously, you know, not ideal for Murray. I think he's just happy that he's still able to compete out here, you know, yeah. with, with going through all those hip surgeries. And he's, he's still super competitive making third round of Masters. Well, not just... At 36. Yeah, I was going to say, not just compete, but put on, like, amazing shows. I mean, we... When you watch an Andy Murray match, you know it's going to be an absolute banger. And he also... I mean, I, we know Berrettini isn't playing the best tennis, but he's beating people like Berrettini. That's not an easy feat. So he's still very much in it. Um so yeah, too bad about Tommy Paul and Andy Murray. Hopefully they recover quickly and are able to be back uh, better than ever. And then uh, since we're on the men's, let's let's go into what we can expect for this coming up and coming week two. A few things to mention. So we predicted Yannick Sinner to win the tournament. Um, Yannick Sinner seems to have a great draw. He really does. He has a great next few rounds. Um, I mean, he's playing O'Connell in the round of 16, then the winner of Arnaldi and Mahach. Yeah. You know, three unseated guys. So, you know, if all goes according to plan, Yannick is easily in that in that semifinal. Yeah. And if against he, probably, you know, probably a Medvedev who has a fairly easy round of 16 match against Kupfer, and then maybe either... Um, Rude or Jari in the next round, but I, I expect Daniel to to make his way through that as well. Yeah, and then like you said, a few I mean a few interesting matches. I I really like that Jari and Rude match. I think Jari has the ability to. I think he's going to beat Rude personally. Um, I think Jari has a game for it, and he's someone who's typically not typically, but has upset big players in the past. And yeah, Rude I mean, is someone he, who. He just He's beat Alcaraz a couple, yeah, like a month ago, exactly. down in South America. Just beat uh, Alcaraz, and also Rude is someone who I feel like can lose to. I mean, remember when he lost to Shelton when Shelton was? Yeah, although whatever. he is having a much better twenty twenty four. Correct. Yes, um, that yeah, that is for sure. But still, um, will be interesting to see how those two compete against each other. And then also another one was uh, Zverev versus Khachanov. Khachanov. That's yeah. an interesting one. Again, Khachanov. You don't you don't pay attention to this guy. This guy, you're, he you're like, up on you. he's... it's Wimbledon, and you're like, oh, let me look at the semifinals, and and he's there, and you're like, how did how the hell did this he's, guy? He's always like randomly floating around, like fifteen to uh, to ten in the world. I don't like really the way he plays, um, but he does consistently pretty well in most tournaments. In all the big tournaments, he's yeah. always doing well in the big tournaments. I'm I'm convinced. So I was thinking about this actually, and I'm convinced the reason why we don't really notice it. He's not a huge name, so they're not going to put him on massive courts, right? Mm-hmm. And you know how you go through YouTube, and if you're not going to watch every single match that happens, I mean, unless you have the time, you're not going to watch every single match that happens during the day. And he's not in the prime spots when people are back from work or or whatever. So they're going to put him on like at 2 p.m. or whatever. And then on top of that, when they release the highlights, I feel like they're releasing, you know, Alcaraz or he's Zverev. He's not for... flashy. He's not Alcaraz. He's exactly. not center. Like, he hits a big ball, but he's not making the highlight reel every night. Exactly. So you're not going to see him, like, on a thumbnail, or you're not going to see him in, uh, pop up and, and be, like, the highlight of, of, the, of, the, of the day. And uh, as a result, I feel like he kind of sneaks by. But, I mean, Hachanov, big enough game to upset Zverev. I don't think that he's going to beat Zverev. But that being said, um, definitely, definitely potential for an upset there. Yeah, and then another match that I want to highlight, really great match. We mentioned him earlier, um, Marotsan against probably one of the hottest players this year in Alex Di Minar. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like, you know, 
Arod Sun's 1-0 against Diminor, beat him last year. I kind of like him to continue his run. I know Alex is having a great year, but I, I, I believe yeah. in I believe in the Hungarian man to, to pull off an upset here. Yeah, no, I could definitely see that too. Let's talk about the women's a little bit because yep. there are some things that happened on the women's side too. Um, first of all, Osaka being back, beating, and not just being back, but beating Svitolina, who is... I mean, she had a great last year, um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. She got to what's if, if I don't want to just say things without being 100 percent certain, but I'm pretty sure she had a really good Wimbledon, if I remember correctly. Um, what did she get to round of, uh, quarterfinals or semis? Let's see. Um, I might be wrong, but I just I know there was a few tournaments there where she did really really well. Yeah, she got to semifinals. Semifinal, last year. yeah. So Lost she got to semis. Silva. Got to semis of, of Wimbledon. Um, I mean, this Svitolina is someone who's very dangerous on, on the WTA. Yeah. And Osaka, great match, was up, I think, 5-2 in the second. And then ended up not choking, but, you know, Svitolina closed she, the she distance. She pulled a Murray. Yeah, she pulled a Murray. She just wanted court time. Um, Svitolina closed the distance, and then they played in the tie break, and, and Osaka got the win. So great to see her back, and... She also said she was like, 2024, everything onwards is a new chapter. So I, I really think she's, she's looking at her tennis career going forward with a positive mind, which is great to see. Yeah, Osaka's looking good. I'm impressed. I mean, she, she won two rounds in Indian Wells. She won two rounds here in Miami. Obviously, she lost her, her next match after Svitolina to, to Garcia. But what I like to see is that she's... Eight, she's able to beat these big yes. WTA players. Right now, I think the thing that she's lacking is just that term- tournament experience of like playing, going far in a tournament, playing Correct. four or five matches, having um, having that conditioning to be able to do that. Because I feel like she, she pulls off a couple big wins, but then she falls a little short or maybe her, her right. conditioning is just not what it used to be it takes time it takes, takes time, time it takes obviously. a lot of tournaments it takes you know you're also traveling and, and doing different stuff so so it definitely takes time do you know who i'm who i'm rooting so hard for who's who's left in this tournament well i i do know one of my favorite wta <laughs> players putin seva yulia yulia just an yeah, absolute she tank she is i mean i've i've her her legs are so strong. I love it. She's just a tree trunk on the court. If you yeah. never watched her, she's a very short girl, but just so strong and, and sturdy and a, and a fighter. St- big personality. Big personality, uh, yeah. Very entertaining to watch. We were at the U.S. Open last year, and we were watching her, and she just wears her emotions on a oh, sleeve. Oh, totally, totally. Very, like, genuinely, like, you know, you look at an athlete, and you're like, that's an athlete. She's one of those people where you look at her and you're like this, I mean, just not even, I mean, I'm sure she works extremely hard, but just genetics wise, like she's just built Yeah. and it's, yeah, just personality matches the, the, the physicality and she, to see her do well at a tournament like this. And she cares so much. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like some players they lose and they're like, they're obviously, they care, but they're not infuriated. She really fights um so it's great to see her do well yeah so wide open women's quarterfinal field i, I think you know Rybakina is obviously the favorite but yep. um a lot of names that that could go out and win it this weekend especially you never know with Rybakina having to pull out of indian wells how, how she's feeling this week exactly so it's going to be interesting to see how so both sides play out now a thing that i wanted to delve into and this is an interesting topic, and this isn't necessarily current events related. I mean, it's related to Miami Open, but there's a video. Casper Ruud, I think he was when he was playing David Fokina. Yep. He sits down on the bench, and he's talking to the umpire and complaining to the umpire about essentially how Miami Open is a very cheap tournament and how they don't take care of the players. Uh, he was saying something about there's only a, a metal chair, not Basically even towels. Basically, the tournament facilities for the players. Exactly. Tournament facilities are poor. They're not providing the players with the tools that they need to, to be comfortable and to, to be at their best. So this, begs, you know, this brings up the question, is Miami Open the worst Masters 1000 that, that we currently have? Um, 
And before I get your opinion on this, let's delve through, let's look at the different Masters 1000s. So we have Indian Wells is the first one. Then right after Indian Wells, we have Miami Open. Then we have Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. Then we have Madrid. Then we have Rome. Rome. Those are the three clay court Masters. Monte Carlo, Madrid, Rome. Then we go into, the we don't have grass. Court. Yeah, hard court. So it goes. So Cincinnati, Toronto, um, Shanghai. Shanghai, and then Paris. Yeah. So those are, um, Max, he already had that. See how I had to do this whole thing where I like go through it slowly? He yeah. already had the list all out. <laughs> He's just being patient with me and being nice. Um, but all of those tournaments are great tournaments, right? Monte Carlo, I mean, is, is stunning. Yeah. Indian Wells, incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, then you have places like Shanghai, and you might say, "Well, what is Shanghai? Is that a good tournament?" It's not a, it's not a player favorite necessarily because it's kind of out of the way, obviously, and also it's at the end of the year. But I'm sure, like the facilities are really nice. I mean, I'd imagine China throws a bunch of money in, at yeah, that event. For sure. Um, and then Paris has a beautiful court. I'm not sure about the facility, but the actual event itself is is built for tennis. Yeah. Miami. We're playing on a football field that is they have to cover up the, the stadium with black to make sure make it seem like it's not empty. Yeah. And then the other courts are on a parking lot. Yeah. So basically, I mean, here's the thing. A lot of the other masters have a lot of history to them. They've been at the same venue for long times. Players are used to them. Um and they're in great cities. And I, I'm not saying Miami is not in a great city, but Miami traditionally had always been in a different location yeah. in Key Biscayne um, until very recently, where they, this probably five year, five, six years ago, they host the tournament, as you were saying, mm -hmm. at the Hard Rock Stadium, which is the home to the Miami Dolphins football team. Right. And the center court is in basically part of you know a quarter of the stadium because that stadium's massive they, they would mean, never fill that up how many people would that fit 70,000 yeah, 80,000 60, whatever 70,000 and then yeah the rest of the tournament is basically in a glorified parking lot pretty much i mean there are there are courts built out and everything but you know it's not the same as so many of these other tournaments that are specifically for tennis yeah that Miami Open, you know, 11, 11 months out of the year is for football. Yeah. And then they do it up for, for the Miami Open. So I, I think that plays a large role into it. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of money that gets thrown at that tournament for it to be in Miami. But yeah, it begs the question, you know, would, would another site around the states be be more suitable for this there there has been a lot of complaints with players not just this year but i remember past years too especially coming off indian wells which is you know characterizes you know the fifth grand slam and the facilities are extremely um luxurious and their players are taken care of there so it's tough to go back to back where you go from one of the best masters to arguably the worst um and you're also tired. You know what yeah. I mean? And that doesn't help. The fact that they're back-to-back, -back, and we mentioned this slightly earlier, but the fact that they're back-to-back, -back, you have to be exhausted. I mean, that's four weeks of all the best players you know, needing to be at the best of their game. That's a long time. Four, that's a month. You're yeah. dedicating a month to, to basically performing at the highest level, which is exhausting. So that combined with lack of facilities, combined with lack of the fact that you can feel when it's not built for tennis and, mm -hmm. and it's like empty and weird and you're walking through different spaces yeah. that are meant for something else. It's just, you can feel all those things and all those things probably compile, which is why rude was, was frustrated. I'd imagine. But, yeah. um, yeah, I think if you compare it to something like a Monte Carlo, you compare it to an Indian Wells, a Rome, even, you know, Rome is not the best masters 1000, but still the stadium is cool and they have what the statues and, yeah. And so, it's definitely not ideal. Um, and I'm curious to see if they upgrade it somehow or what they end up doing to, to make sure that they 
they improve. Well, at least, at least Rome, I, I know Rome's facilities aren't great, and I've heard that as well, but at least Rome has character. Yeah. You know, it's a long-staying tournament. It's a cool, like the stadiums are so old, and the, yeah. it's cool. And the fan, the Italian fans go crazy yes. for tennis. Yes, Miami just seems like they're, they're in this, especially center court, they're in this massive stadium that most of the time is barely half full. Um, and the fans just aren't as into it as as, yeah. as other countries, which is a shame. So it'd be interesting if they ever change that. If they ever say, okay, Miami, you're done. Let's move you to... I don't know. I can't see. I mean, I don't know what kind of long-term deal they signed when they moved the, yeah. uh, the tournament to Hard Rock Stadium, but I, I imagine it was, you know, at least 10 years or something. Yeah. 10, 15 years. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. But, but Miami, obviously, yeah, not, not ideal with the circumstances. But, and then we were talking about scheduling... And they just, I mean, you can speak more onto this because yeah. one, a lot of details yeah. um, that don't fit into this head. I know. But two, um, you know, ATP made some changes uh, with scheduling, also with uh, the weight of each tournament. So some 250s are now 500s. Um, let's talk about that and let's see where we could fit Miami into yeah. that schedule. Yeah, so I, you know, we... We talked about this briefly last year when the ATP made an announcement about some of this, but this was the official 2025 schedule, ATP yep. schedule that came out today. Um, and some some of the big things are that we're losing a few of the 250 tournaments, which and two of them in the states, which is a shame. You know, we're losing Newport, Rhode Island, which this is all for 2025, by the way. Newport, Rhode Island, Atlanta. Um, Cordoba, Lyon's another one, and then um, one in Portugal as well. So that that's a shame. It's always, you know, it's never fun to lose tournaments. And then a couple tournaments are being upgraded to yeah. 500s from 250s. We have Munich, uh, Dallas, and Doha that are all becoming 500s yeah. next year. And then a couple tournaments are just shifting around the calendar. Which is interesting, and one tournament that we've talked about in the past, that's it's that's always in such a strange, it's the worst, strange uh, week of the year, is the 500 tournament in Hamburg. Yeah, which is after Roland Garros, like when you're zero sense when you you know when you're starting the um, grass court and hard court season. They've moved that now to the week before Roland Garros. So having a 500 tournament the week before. Um, so yeah, I, I think hopefully some bigger names might might sign up for that tournament. I know a lot of the times they have trouble recruiting big players because who's it's, gonna play? It's kind of like court. the last clay court tournament for a while. Yeah. Well, no, it's better. I think it's definitely better to have Hamburg in. The, obviously, it's better to have Hamburg the week before. French Open, because why would you have a clay court? I mean, the grass court is already so, grass court season is already so short. You want to maximize your time on grass. You're not going to go and play a clay court after you just played the Grand Slam. Yeah. So definitely an improvement. Whether or not players are going to play it because it's the week before French Open and you probably want to rest and, and prepare in Paris, um, that's a different story. But I guess we'll have to see how, what players sign up and and what the you know what the deal is when it comes to it but definitely an improvement yeah i mean sure. the real story before we get into talking about miami scheduling i just want to mention the the kind of underlying story that's going you know a bit under the radar is that i th a lot of these scheduling moves are prob probably as a result of a lot of saudi arabian money that's being pumped into tennis and I think their goal in 2026 and beyond is to start hosting tournaments. So right. I think 2025 is going to be a bit of like a transition year for the ATP to push out some older tournaments right. to have to open up space gotcha. for for this Saudi money to come in in 2026. So, all, so it's all the it's all part. It's of a the lot plan. of politics. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but then we were talking about, okay, where can we fit Miami Open? Because Miami Open, back-to-back -back with Indian Wells, not ideal, like we mentioned. Players are tired. Injuries. So, yeah, you, you're just not great, right? And also, you want to spread out the best of the best. You don't want to have them 
back to back because then I feel like you get to enjoy the individual tournaments more. Um, and we were saying that it makes sense to put Miami before Indian Wells and have it be in February. Um, February is a very slow month. There's nothing that really goes on. I think there's like one 500, right? I think it's Dallas. Well, Dallas next year, but it's Acapulco. Acapulco is a 500. Yeah. Right? So there's Dallas in February. There's Acapulco. Um, so we were saying the best spot to put Miami is the week before Acapulco, because then you have a big masters 1000, you still have Acapulco, which is a cool tournament. So you'll still have people go and travel and play that one. Um, but yeah, that way you spread it out and you have February, good month, March, good month. Um, and, and then you go into clay. Yeah. And it, there's also, you know, you have that tournament in Delray beach already in Florida. Yep. If you put that before the week of Miami, like maybe the first or second week of February, you know, you have a bunch of players that can play a warm up tournament and then Miami and Delray beach are so close. Yeah. You know, you stay another week to play Miami afterwards. hundred percent. So, so a little bit of thinking. So ATP, if you want to hire us as consultants, you know, we're, we, we're, we're our, open. Our DMs are open. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then last but not least, guys, point of the week. Now, typically when we do a point of the week, we like to give you a good point. You know, something, oh, Carlos Alcaraz, impossible to pass, or, you know, Medvedev does this, or Sinner does that, and it's all this sensational stuff. But point of the week can be both good and bad. Right, it's the the highlight point of the week, the, the point that that caught our attention the most. Um, and this week's is Casper uh, Rude versus Davidovich Fokina. They're playing the point, and just to put it shortly, Casper Rude has a sitter. We're talking a sitter overhead, where he's running up to the ball, and Davidovich Fokina basically stops playing. He stops. He stands. He waits. And Casper Ruud, in, in beautiful fashion, uh, hits the ball into the net. And I love his reaction post-miss the post miss because he misses the ball. The crowd goes, at what just happened. And no expression change. Walks back, shakes it off like a true professional. Um, <laughs> no, not even a smile. Like a true Scandinavian. Yeah, like a true <laughs> Scandinavian. Uh, no emotion, no, no expression. Um, we love our Scandinavian friends. We do. It's just, we, we joke about it because it's actually exactly what one of our teammates would have done uh, when we played at Fordham. So um, anyway, it, bad point, but definitely one to, to note and, the, the, you know, that comes to attention. Not all point of the weeks can be, can be beautiful That's and, right. and glorious, sometimes, you know? Sometimes you have gloriously bad points. Yeah. Um, but yeah. To these top tennis players have been playing their entire lives. They make millions of dollars. They can still miss balls like that. You know, they're, they're only human. So yeah. um, definitely, definitely thought we would, would mention that and talk about that one. Max, going into week two. Guys, also next week. Should we let them bit know? Of, yeah, uh, let's let them know. Okay. Um, so scheduling wise, I'm, I'm going to be traveling. Steven's going to be traveling. So this legend, I mean, you, you're better off with him anyway. Uh, first of all, this 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 is the brains behind behind the the, the tennis current events and, and knowledge and all that. So, um, you are going to be, well, we'll attempt to do it solo. I'm I mean, attempt is kind of the key word there. <laughs> that you know, I they could be watching me next week with like my face upside down and like <laughs> I'm usually no lighting, yeah, like exactly. just a silhouette. <laughs> it's just crooked. No. So Max is going to be, is going to, is going to take the rundown and, and do a solo episode, basically take you guys through the week's events and, and, and give his breakdowns and thoughts and opinions and, and talk about the highlights of week two of Miami open. We can't miss week two. You know, we, we thought, should we miss it? We can't. It's one of the bigger tournaments of the year. It's in the U.S. We're in the U.S. We have to represent. We have to. We have to. You know, comment. Um, so, guys, make sure you tune in for Max's tracksuit rundown episode next week. Thank you so much for the support. If you made it this far to the video, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Appreciate the support always. And um, yeah, you uh, you will take it away. See you next week. That's right. All right. Thank you guys. Peace.